Sammy Sosa saved baseball, but can this video save him? This is where Sammy Sosa's downfall began. On June 3, 2003, he broke his bat on a full count ground out. Crew chief Tim McClelland, then serving as the home plate umpire, walked out to the splintered remains and found a pocket of cork. A band modification meant to send the baseball farther by making the bat lighter and creating a greater bounce, a trampoline effect if you will, off the barrel's surface. Sosa was ejected from the game and later served a suspension. So. There it is, right? We haven't even talked about PEDs, and we've already proven Sammy Sosa was a fraud. Sure, he claimed his only intention was to put on a show for the fans in batting practice, but clearly he'd been cheating all along and only now just got caught. What most of Sosa's detractors won't acknowledge is that the league immediately seized 76 of Sammy Sosa's bats, x-rayed them, and found no corking. They also called up the Hall of Fame, who delivered five of the bats Sosa used in various milestones for testing. This included the bat used for his 500th home run just a couple months prior. They too came back clean. Hall of Famer Joe Morgan, then of ESPN, wrote in Sosa's defense, saying he too once accidentally used a cork bat in a game. Twenty years later, in an uncharacteristic incident, future Hall of Famer Max Scherzer was suspended 10 games for sticky stuff. His legacy remains rightfully intact despite foreign substances on the baseball having a far more quantifiable effect than a corked bat. Yes, the intent to disrupt the competitive balance is what matters, but given the x-ray results, all signs point to this being an isolated incident and honest mistake on Sosa's part. Yet this moment is brought up frequently when discussing Slam and Sammy's legacy. For the doping speculators, it solidifies his reputation as a rule breaker, someone willing to cross lines to gain an unfair competitive advantage. But as you'll learn now, the ties between Sammy Sosa and performance enhancing drug usage are far more tenuous than most give him credit for. This is where Sammy Sosa's downfall continued, testifying in front of Congress about PED usage in baseball prior to the 2005 season. He was not alone. Seated with him were Mark McGuire, Rafael Palmero, and Kurt Schilling, but the real man of the hour was Jose Canseco. His memoir, Juiced, had just exposed the prevalence of steroid usage in MLB locker rooms, and he named names, including Palmero and McGuire, as users. Although Canseco was, and still continues to be viewed as an unreliable narrator, most of the accusations made in Juiced turned out to be true. Palmero tested positive for a banned substance five months later, McGuire admitted to steroid use in 2010, while Schilling, who was invited for being explicitly anti-PED, left the hearing unscathed. That leaves Sosa. One unsympathetic interpretation of Sosa's performance goes something like this. He got up to testify and suddenly pretended not to understand English, despite dealing with the media in English for years as a ball player. It's true that the Dominican slugger had a lawyer read a pre-written statement for him, but it's also true that he followed that up with his own off-the-cuff statement in English, then proceeded to field questions from members of Congress in English for the rest of the session. In answering those questions, he kept it brief and didn't say much of substance, but it is a much less damning performance than some would think. He's mainly guilty by association, surrounded by credible, documented steroid users. Language-wise, I guess what's being held against him here is having the lawyer deliver the initial statement. These guys were under oath, and it seemed like a cold and calculated way to avoid lying under that oath. But anyone who speaks a second language would tell you it takes far less precision to answer mundane questions about your job than avoid accidental perjury in front of Congress. Language knowledge is not a binary. It's not either you know English or you don't know English. You know enough English to handle certain situations, but not all of them. I don't think anyone who ever had to learn a second language, particularly as an adult, would fault Sosa for leaning on his lawyer at times during this situation. Because make no mistake, the US government was totally willing to use these hearings as a perjury trap. The feds later indicted Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds when their testimonies didn't line up with the corresponding investigations. 
They could have gone to jail. And for what? Not for using steroids, for lying about not using steroids. This is where Sammy Sosa's downfall was solidified, in the New York Times on June 16, 2009. See, in 2007, the Mitchell Report was released, the result of a 20-month investigation into performance-enhancing drug use in Major League Baseball. Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, and Gary Sheffield were some of the key names implicated in the report for their ties with Balco, a drug lab. This group never failed a drug test and never admitted to any wrongdoing, but their inclusion in the report and Balco investigation have cemented their reputations. Almost everyone acknowledges that these guys knowingly used steroids during their careers. It's whether that use was just a symptom of the era they played in, or enough to expel them from the history books that's been debated. So far, they've been kept out of the Hall of Fame. Sammy Sosa was never named in the Mitchell Report. 89 ballplayers were, but he was not part of that group. There were other sluggers with Hall of Fame numbers who weren't named in the report, but got popped and served suspensions once regular testing was implemented. Manny Ramirez is a prominent example. He's not in the Hall of Fame either. But Sammy Sosa never served a suspension for PED use, and he never failed a drug test. Well, at least not officially. Back to the New York Times, who in 2009 published some of the bigger names from 2003 testing conducted by Major League Baseball. That 2003 test was a penalty-free exercise in cooperation with the Players' Union. The league wanted to find out what percentage of players would fail their screening, and if it was over 5%, they would implement regular testing and suspensions. Of course, over 100 players popped, well over the 5% threshold, but it was only supposed to be a proving ground for the necessity of testing in the first place. And as part of their negotiation with the union, the results were to be kept secret. In fact, they were supposed to be destroyed. The government prosecutors investigating the league felt differently. They were only supposed to be investigating Balco when they came across the 104 positives from the 2003 trial. They seized the test results even though they were outside the bounds of the narrow list of names they were permitted to dig up dirt on. The Players' Union pressed them on it, and in August 2009, a federal appeals court in California ruled that the prosecutors improperly seized the tests. They would not be admissible in any court. The full list of names never leaked. The substances in question never leaked. They were supposed to be voluntary, anonymous, and private. And yet, a few major names were connected to the 2003 testing. One of them was Sammy Sosa, but another was David Ortiz. And while Sosa languished on the Hall of Fame writer's ballot for 10 years without getting close to the 75% threshold, Ortiz waltzed right in first try. When the question of Ortiz's 2003 positive came up toward the end of his career, then-Commissioner Rob Manfred gave him plausible deniability stating there were more than 10 names on the list where the union and MLB questioned the legitimacy of the result. And at the time, that was fine. The league just wanted to prove that PED use was a problem in the sport. Not every individual test result needed to be scrutinized. There were no suspensions or reputations at stake, at least not until US prosecutors overstepped. But that same plausible deniability has not been extended to Sosa, who is generally accepted as a doper and lumped in with players who were either named in the Mitchell Report or served PED suspensions. He's presumed guilty in the court of public opinion. If there's anything to be learned so far, it's that the feds really bungled their role in investigating the steroid era. They felt empowered to step in because the league was sitting on their hands, but they proceeded to improperly seize test results and go after some of the game's biggest stars on perjury charges. And because that happened, I don't think fans will ever get closure. It might be a nice gesture, even two decades later, if Barry Bonds came out and said, I knowingly did it, and I'm sorry. That might actually go a long way, but it probably won't happen because the US government spent years trying to convict him of a felony. And not the felony of taking steroids, the felony of lying about not taking steroids. 
for Sosa, the uncharitable interpretation of the corked bat and uncharitable interpretation of his PED connections have led to an uncharitable interpretation of his career. Fans and media alike feel free to speculate about his aging curve. The majority of Sosa's career production came in a five-year span from 1998 to 2002, his age 29 to age 33 seasons. But he wasn't exactly a nobody leading into his peak. In the previous five-year stretch, 1993 to 1997, he was one of only 11 hitters to average 30 homers in four war per season, putting him in pretty strong company. Sure, it took him a while to get going, but the same could be said about Roberto Clemente and Robin Yount. Sure, he got bigger, but so did these guys playing under strict testing. And sure, his sustained peak was later than most, but the same could be said about Adrian Beltre. I would argue the PED aging curve is actually an anti-aging curve. Players who are able to maintain their athleticism into their late 30s and early 40s. Roger Clemens won two Cy Youngs and Barry Bonds won four MVPs after 35. Sosa was basically irrelevant by that age. And there's an explanation for that too. On April 20th, 2003, he was struck on the head by a fastball that even damaged his helmet. He left the game, but returned for the next one despite likely being concussed. His career declined sharply after that day. His plate approach in particular faltered, possibly the result of standing further back from the plate for fear of getting hit again. So yeah, he had a five-year stretch coinciding with the peak of the steroid era where he hit most of his home runs, but how is that even evidence? Oh, his offense was at its highest when offense around the league was at its highest? That just makes sense. In 1999 and 2000 in particular, some were even speculating about a juiced ball, similar to discussions that took place in the late 2010s. Imagine that in Wrigley. If MLB still can't get consistent results now, who is to say the league-wide power outburst wasn't more about juiced baseballs than juiced players? After all, the pitchers were supposedly cheating too. Even an outlier season like 1968, the year of the pitcher, could have been the result of a baseball that was deadened. Confronted with the reality that Sosa could have been doing things legitimately, and there isn't a smoking gun that proves otherwise, detractors will sometimes even make the, well, he wasn't really that great to begin with, statistical argument. In some ways, players like Bobby Abreu and Jim Edmonds would compare favorably to Sosa, but most people making those comparisons will say the peak is what matters, and Sosa sure had the peak. The third, fifth, and sixth most homers in a season in MLB history, including a 200 OPS plus 10 war 2001, something only five hitters have accomplished since integration. Since retiring from the game of baseball, Sammy Sosa has creeped people out by changing his appearance. In photos, he's appeared lighter in complexion and with a different hair texture than his playing days. Now, to be clear, I look like this, so I'm probably not the guy to hone in on the nuances of colorism in our society. But let's just say a darker Dominican like Sosa might have used this bleaching cream because of black self-hatred, or simply because he got carried away with his skincare routine. If it's the former, it's certainly sad. People laugh and get their jokes in, but it also makes them uncomfortable, and people don't like that discomfort. It creates a negative association. Even in pointing out that Sammy Sosa's corked bat was likely a mistake, his testimony before Congress's story that has been misconstrued, and his PED links tenuous, you probably thought to yourself, yeah, but why does he look like that now? This isn't just about the Hall of Fame. Sosa fell off the ballot having never received even 20% of the writer's vote. It's about an icon estranged from the game of baseball itself. A player credited with reviving the league's popularity post-strike by chasing down Roger Maris. A chase that wouldn't have been captivating if not for Sosa embracing the spotlight while McGuire shied away. In early 2024, Sosa made a surprise visit to Chicago, 20 years after parting ways with the Cubs. He's been excluded from the organization ever since at the behest of the owners, the Ricketts family. No games, no spring training, no fan fest, no alumni events, nothing. Some Cubs fans are just fine with this arrangement. They cheered for Sosa when he was on top of the baseball world, but have no interest in him now. His reputation as a teammate was spotty, and he famously ditched Wrigley early during what was supposed to be his final game there. 
On the subject of forgiveness, Tom Ricketts offered this much for those suspected of PED use. Players of that era owe us a little bit of honesty, too. I feel like the only way to turn this page is just to put everything on the table. So that's the ultimatum. Sosa has to admit he cheated to be brought back into the fold. That may be his personal standard, but it's not the norm. Barry Bonds never apologized. The Giants retired his number, and the Pirates will be inducting him into their Hall of Fame regardless. Like Sosa, he didn't have a reputation as a good locker room guy and exited his teams on bad terms. Whether Sammy Sosa was an egotistical teammate who cheated with both PEDs and corked bats and was too cowardly to admit it, or whether he did nothing wrong, the way his legacy has been handled by the Cubs, the league, the media, the fans, and even himself is an absolute embarrassment to the game. And as things stand right now, it won't be rectified anytime soon. Hey, thanks for watching. To see your name here, head on over to patreon.com/foolishbaseball. Also, thank you to Maxo for the music.